Good morning. I'm Joel Martin, the new provost here. And as provost, I have the privilege of working with the Mueller Fellow Program. The Mueller Fellowship Endowment was established in 1980 to bring distinguished men and women to Franklin and Marshall College for a visit of more than one day to participate in a full schedule of classes and or seminars, meet informally with students, and when appropriate with groups of interested faculty. This enriched approach to guest speakers was the vision of the Mueller family, in particular, Judge Paul A. Mueller, Jr. and his wife, Jane. Judge Paul Mueller served on f and Board of Trustees and as the college's attorney. He created the fellowship in honor of his father, Paul Mueller, Sr., who had also served on the board and received an honorary degree from his alma mater. I believe Judge Mueller is here today, so let's please communicate our appreciation to him. Thanks to the gift of the Mueller's, many distinguished men and women have come to meet with students and faculty at Franklin Marshall College, including Justice Harry Blackman, philosopher Paul Ramsey, naturalist and filmmaker Sir David Attenborough, author John McPhee, politician Eugene McCarthy, historian David McCullough, public intellectual Cornell West, physicist Freeman Dyson, performance artist Laurie Anderson, columnist Thomas L. Friedman, sports writer Frank DeFord, filmmaker Spike Lee, biologist E.O. Wilson, and many others. This year's Mueller Fellow, joining that list of illustrious former Mueller Fellows, is Jay Winter, the Charles J. Still Professor of History at Yale University. Dr. Winter is one of the world's leading experts on World War I and its impact on the 20th century. His visit marks a high point in Franklin and Marshall's year-long commemoration of the centenary of the First World War. There are many wonderful things to say about Dr. Winter as a scholar, as an intellectual leader, as a shaper of memory and conscience. He's the author or co-author of a dozen books and editor of the monumental three-volume Cambridge History of the First World War, published in 2014. Professor Winter was one of the founders of a major museum in France dedicated to the First World War. He was co-producer, co-writer, and chief historian for the PBS series, The Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century, which won an Emmy Award, a Peabody Award, and a Producers Guild of America Award for Best Television Documentary in 1997. During his visit to campus, Professor Winter has been visiting classes, meeting with small groups of students and faculty. And tonight, I remind and repeat the invitation, remind you of the invitation to the college-wide reception to be held from 6 to 8 p.m. in Brooks College House Great Room. All are welcome, students, faculty, staff, and yes, even trick-or-treaters. In this way, and many others, uh, thanks to the Mueller's, we are able to have Professor Winter with us. He will stretch our minds and remind us once again of why we are all fortunate to be part of this campus community. His common hour talk is entitled, Making Sense of Our Violent Times, The First World War in Transnational Perspective. Please welcome Dr. Jay Winter. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you indeed for the invitation uh, to be here as a Mueller Fellow uh, in this year uh, of the centenary uh, of the outbreak uh, of the First World War. Uh, now, what I would like to do is to bring you uh, some uh, thoughts about the special moment in which we're living uh, today. Uh, it seems to me that there are two things that have happened in the course of my academic life um, over the period from the mid-1960s to the present uh, that help us understand why remembrance, why memory is such an important part of our cultural life. Uh, the first uh, point I want to make is that uh, when I graduated university in 1966, um, it was at a moment when there was the largest expansion in higher education in North America and Europe since the Henrician Reformation of the 16th century. 
And between 1960 and 1990, the population of students in higher education in North America and in Europe trebled. And with that extraordinary expansion came the appearance in our societies of the largest group of educated citizens in history. It doesn't necessarily mean that their higher education gives them insight to support politicians in making the right decisions, but it does mean that there is a substantial population of people who are interested in consuming cultural capital. And among them, among this population and among the objects, uh, is uh, memory. Memory is a light consumer durable good which is sold throughout our societies. And in many respects, those of us who've lived through this period have seen a memory boom. Memory is a very large industry today, and I think part of the reason is that there are more consumers interested in memory than ever before. Now, from the 1980s, there occurred, I think, a, a move towards the creation of institutions of memory that are now very, very popular and ubiquitous. And sociologists have told us something about the parallel development that may have made it possible. The parallel development in large parts of Western Europe, and in part, though not all, of North America, is the decline of attendance in traditional religious institutions. What a sociologists call secularization, the move away from religious institutions is central to the lives of families and to the lives of nations. In my view, is not the end of the sacred. The sacred simply has left the churches and moved to institutions of memory nearby. In my own lifetime, this memory boom has been focused by and large on a number of questions that used to be asked in churches. Uh, why is there suffering in the world? Why do the just or the innocent die? Uh, what does it mean when a man l l uh, gives his life, lays down his life for his brothers? These are all of the questions that theologians have asked uh, since uh, uh, the time before Jesus and the time before the Old Testament. And now that we collectively ask those questions, but don't do so in the traditional churches as much as we did in the past, it isn't that the questions have gone away, it's that the focus has changed. And the focus in many parts of the world, and especially in Western Europe, although I think next year, in 2015, the focus will be here. What, is it an hour away to Gettysburg? On the question of what does war do to the societies that wage it? How deep are the scars? How are those scars healed, if ever? What happens to those who are broken in war? What happens to the families of those who are lost? All of these questions suggest the truth to a statement that Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary leader, made 70 years ago, which was that you may not be interested in war, but war is very interested in you. And the way in which war has shaped the world in which we live seems to me to be very important in understanding the memory boom of the 20th century and of our own times. From the 1980s on, there occurred a series of events in this country and elsewhere that made the subject of memory absolutely essential. Consider the American Medical Association's change in its handbook of diagnoses and treatments of the recognition of post-traumatic stress disorder in 1980, five years after the end of the Vietnam War. Consider Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial in 1982. She actually designed that project as a meditation on the First World War and on the architecture of the First World War. Mind you, in my, she did it in my university at Yale in the School of Architecture, and she got a B plus for her project. Uh, her uh, teacher, also, whose name I will draw a veil of discretion over, um, her teacher also submitted uh, a project to the commission that was looking into a way of honoring those who died uh, in Vietnam. Um, and uh, he didn't get anywhere, but she did. In 1982, that particular project created a physical site of memory that uh, captured the imagination of the country. In the same year, 1982, in my university, 
some very remarkable people in comparative literature and elsewhere, created the first archive of Holocaust survivors, the Fortunoff uh, uh, Holocaust Archive, which spawned many different imitators, up to and including Steven Spielberg, who always does something 50 times larger than everyone else. But his impulse came from the 1980s initiatives in saying that those who know the capacity for evil in the world and have survived to tell the tale are moral witnesses. They are people who we need to listen to. And in the 1980s elsewhere, there were all extraordinary projects that added up in many parts of the world to an equivalence. I want to put it very simply and qualify it later on. Remembrance in the 1980s in Europe at a time when nuclear warfare was indeed a possibility. These are the times, you know, the last years of the evil empire of the Soviet Union, of Reagan and Thatcher and so on. These years were a time where remembrance of the two world wars became a pacifist project. And by pacifist, I mean a reason why the European Union is important, way beyond the euro and the exchange rates of currencies. The European Union matters because it is a turn away from the wars that disfigured the European continent in the First World War and the Second World War in matters that the world had never seen before. Perhaps 10 million men died, probably more, in the First World War. Twice that many died in the Second. The European Union has many flaws, and I'm far from being its most ardent admirer, but it is infinitely better than the world that it replaced the world of the Nazis, the world of Stalin, uh, indeed uh, the world of the First World War itself. So I want to talk to you about a moment, a moment that is not only important academically, but is also important for citizens all over the world. It is a moment when memory became, in many respects, what I would call part and parcel of popular culture. Now remembrance is an action. Memory is a product, Mem remembrance, is a process, we all have memories, but when we have them together, as in this occasion, which is a moment of remembrance of the First World War, we are talking about subjects that go beyond the academy. I spent most of my life teaching in England, and in the 25 years I taught at the University of Cambridge, many of my colleagues were suspicious of someone like me who did television work, created a museum, and so on on the grounds that if something is said simply, it must be simple-minded. Never underestimate the uh, je jealousy of, uh, of colleagues about what can be done in the public sphere. And I want to tell you about a project that started me off in this direction of public history and that still is alive today that may help me uh, illustrate to you what the memory boom is about, why it matters, why it's going to be there long after I uh, retire and after many of the people with whom I've worked are no longer on the scene. And it's about a moment, a moment, and I think this is uh, particularly important in terms of the Mueller Fellowship, which I am delighted to join. Most history, in my experience, is uh, born through family history. And the honor that the judge has made in memory of his father is one example of many different forms of remembrance that take place all over the world today. The First World War was the moment when world history and family history crossed. That's why it is inscribed so deeply into the life of many societies. Less so in the United States, which between 1917 and 18 got a bloody nose in the First World War, whereas European countries received a wound that hasn't closed to this day. Now, I don't mean to be disrespectful. 110,000 American soldiers died between 1917 and 18, which is quite a density of death. But half of them died of the Spanish influenza epidemic and would have died had they been here, where the Spanish influenza took the young and the healthy, the way in which viruses do. So 55,000 makes it about the same level, roughly, of the Vietnam War, but in a shorter period of time. That total, 55,000 dead, was the casualty total uh, for the French army in one month of 1914, in August 1914. The war lasted for 50 months. Hence the claim I make that the First World War is not written into family history the way it is in Europe. 
and the way it is in many parts of the world that served in the First World War because it was an imperial war that brought imperial power and imperial manpower uh, to bear on the, the subject of uh, on fighting and indeed on supporting the fighting. Now, that family history made a difference in my life that I want to share with you today. In 1986, I was teaching at the University of Cambridge, and I got a phone call from someone in France who was interested in building a museum to one of the ugliest battles in history called the Battle of the Somme. If you want to read about it, take Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night, for example, and he walks over the battlefields of the Somme and said, this could never happen again. It was monstrous. It was the artillery battle to beat all battles. This is a, a battle in which there were one million casualties over a period of six months in which there was no gain on either side. One million casualties. On the first night of the bombardment leading into the battle, one million shells were fired. Now these numbers literally defy my imagination to understand them. But what had happened was the industrialization of killing and in the First World War, the second industrialization of chemistry, of engineering, of metallurgy, and all that came to bear upon the way war was waged. And it was done in a fashion that describes a poignancy, uh, I think, which is fundamental. And it is that the First World War is the history of the decencies of mil millions of men who were betrayed by their political and military leaders who didn't have the imagination to realize what they were doing by going to war. They lifted the lid on Pandora's box, but were unable to control the forces of violence they let loose. The Battle of the Somme is the moment, Ernst Junger, the German writer, said, when the 20th century was born. And unfortunately, the 20th century is with us still. Today in Syria, who knows where tomorrow. Now, the phone call was from a gentleman whose father fought in the First World War in the French army. His name was Max Lejeune. He was a French politician. And his dad came home from the First World War without a scratch on him, but a broken man, and mistreated his son throughout his childhood, beat him, abused him and his wife. And this gentleman, who was now in his late 70s and had been a major French politician, wanted to make peace with his father, wanted to create a monument to his father, which would be a monument of transcendence, of the terrible injury that is done to soldiers who face these circumstances of industrialized war without very much to defend their frail bodies in the process. And so he wanted to do a monument, a museum of the Battle of the Somme for his dad. And I said to him, why not do a museum of the whole war? Because after all, the First World War was there, not just this battle, French, British, and German, between three and four million soldiers, over a million horses, involved as extraordinary battle as it was. Uh, why not do the whole war? And he said, all right. Then I said to him, and you know, it, to create a museum, you really need to have a link with the academy because museums that don't have a link, an organic link to scholarship, tend to atrophy and turn into dust right away. So he said, fine. And I said, well, what about this academic link creating a research center where we can design the museum? instead of the other way around. You know, the scholars could create a museum from scholarship, use their words, use their work, and then create something for the public as a whole. Fine. Then he asked me the French question, combien, which means how much. And I wish I had added a couple of zeros to what I told him, but he bought it. He took out his Tammany Hall book, and he wrote down Centre de Recherche, so many uh, francs at the time, and he bought it and made it a line item in the um, in the budget of the region of France, which he ran, uh, probably personally, with one or two others helping him, no doubt. And so we got the money to create a museum. Now, this is part of the memory boom. It's creating sites of memory, creating places where people go to ask the profound questions that used to be asked in the churches. Why do men die at the age of 18? Why do parents bury their children? Why is it that those who suffer from psychiatric illness are ignored, not acknowledged, not treated, despised, and spurned. All kinds of questions that are directly related to the old theological questions are now asked in museums, in cemeteries, in sites of memory. And next year at Appomattox, the same questions will be asked 150 years after the end of the Civil War. Then came the question, all right, we're going to design a museum. What should it look like? 
And that's where a bit of serendipity, of pure luck, which I'm sure governs most of our lives, a bit of pure luck happened. I love to go on holiday mountain walking in Switzerland, not mountain climbing, but walking up in the high pastures with the beautiful flowers and so on, in a little village in Switzerland called Sils Maria. It's in the Engadine in the southeast of, of Switzerland, and if there is a paradise, it looks like Sils Maria. It's that beautiful, and it never changes. It's always as beautiful as the last time you saw it. It's wonderful. And on the way from Cambridge, long drive, two days, I took my children, then age 10 and 11, when I got this assignment to build a museum, along with a very talented group of people. I didn't do this alone, for heaven's sakes. This is part of collective work uh, that I want to describe to you later. We stopped in a village in Alsace, near, in, near the town of Colmar, had some wonderful uh, food and, and drink and so on, and I took my children, my son in one hand on the left, and my daughter in one hand on the right, to the great art gallery, the Kunstmuseum in Basel. And I walked up some stairs, and there I saw something which absolutely knocked me over. I saw this. This is a, a picture a painting that was the only painting in a room. It was astounding, and I remember saying to my children, I gave this lecture in London not long ago, and they both remembered when I said to them, holding their hands, I said, your dad has to sit down. This knocked me over. And in one of those flashes, which you can't explain rationally, I saw what I had to do. I saw how to build a museum. This is a painting of Hans Holbein in 1520. It is the perfect Reformation painting. This is a painting of Christ completely dead, dead in a way that has no equivocation. In order for anyone to believe that this dead body will rise on Easter Sunday, they can only do it through faith alone. This is Martin Luther's message created in a visual form. And that visual form is unremittingly, completely horizontal. There was the idea. Almost all of the war museums that I've seen in my life have the vertical as the language of weaponry, the vertical as the language of soldiers, uniforms. What about if we constructed a museum of the horizontal? Don't forget that the great war winning weapon in the First World War was the spade. Soldiers dug themselves underground. They buried themselves under the ground in order to stay alive. Everything that happened, seriously happened in the First World War at the in the front, happened underground, happened downward. How can we force the view of visitors to a museum downward by using the horizontal? And I found this just in a flash and began to say, well, are there other instances that we can see where there are profound statements <coughs> about horizontality that we can use? Of course, once you start looking, you can find them. Here's, here's another one. This is by Andrea Mantegna, The Lamentation of Christ in 1480. Notice the, you know, the, the, the fact that this isn't quite as pure as the painting that I just showed you of Hans Holbein. They're, they're Mary's mourning who are vertical in the corner, top left. Uh, but it's still pretty unusual to see the body of Christ in virtually a horizontal position. By making the vision of the viewer uh, horizontal, the body of Christ looks just like you and me. It has a palpable, personal approach, which is what knocked me over. By the way, 10 years later, one of my students at Cambridge came up to me and handed me Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot. And in that novel, Prince Mishkin comes in and says, I just saw a painting that almost made me lose my faith. It was this one. It was Hans Holbein. I'm far from the only person who was knocked over by this amazing image, utterly and completely realistic. And, and have a look, by the way, at the middle finger of the hand of Christ in the foreground, which is dislocated because of crucifixion. Look at the hair hanging down. This is, this is unremitting realism in the 1520s. So after Montaigne, I found this one. This is Vittorio Carpaccio's uh, Venetian uh, painting, The Dead Christ even before he got into the tomb being prepared. Do you see how the hair hangs down? The same horizontality created what I would call a humanity to Christ, which is not that that suggests or points to the resurrection, but points to the stupefying fact of the resurrection as something which defies 
indeed confounds our reason. And then I moved into the 20th century and found lots of horizontality. This one served me best. This is Katie Kovitz's uh, lithograph of, a, of a, a widow, a war widow, simply trying to find some degree of comfort in her entirely horizontal life now that her husband has died and she has a child to care for on her own uh, in a world without pity. Now, the, the point was that once I had the idea of horizontality, I had to convince my colleagues, I did this as a wonderful group of people. Collective work is insufficiently recognized in the academy because people who make appointments and promotions, I'm glad the provost is here, um, usually say, what part did X play? Which part is his creativity? And there's some projects you can't do that. It's simply too big. You can't create a museum by yourself. Collective work is undervalued in the academy. It's not in chemistry or in mathematics or in physics, but it is in the humanities and, and much of the social sciences, and I think that's a pity. Fortunately, I had tenure and really didn't care what my colleagues in the University of Cambridge thought about it. All I wanted to do was to create something different, and this is the way we did it. Whoops, too many. We dug out of the ground what we call foss. These are small trenches, two feet deep, 20 feet long, about eight feet wide. And in them, we put real objects. In other words, there's a very large antiquarian uh, market in the uniforms and the weaponry and everything, the lice powder, the toothpaste, all the stuff that soldiers had. The one on the left is French, the one on the right is German, and the transnational part of this story is it doesn't make a damn bit of difference which uniform you uh, wore, the lice were gonna get you, one way or the other, and if the artillery didn't first. But the important point is by forcing the vision of the public downward, we were making a statement about war which was different from that of many other places in the world, and I, you know, I, I suggest that you think about that the next time you go to the Smithsonian or to the Air and Space Museum, or indeed to the uh, Washington Memorial, you know, unremittingly vir uh, 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 vertical, and many other examples I could cite. Now, the other point about the objects put in is that they are clearly stylized. We believe that it is almost impossible to represent war. It is so horrible, so horrific, and so full of shocking and bizarre images that the, uh, that the best way to create a museum of war is to force people to think about how to represent it, not to show them plastic rats or mud that is really made out of paper, or mache or whatever, but to raise the issue of how you represent war in all of its ugliness. This, this is something that is a question rather than an answer. Here's, whoops, too, too quick. This is a second way of using the horizontal. Down at the bottom right, you can see the German trench. And on the walls are three lines of objects that civilians uh, created or developed in their own way. And in between those two points are video screens that show the objects in use by civilians or by soldiers. And the use of video screens, this is 1992 when it was finally opened, it took six years to design this and, do, and build it, the use of video screens is almost hypnotic. You know, I've, I've written my share of books on the First World War, but I'm utterly persuaded that what matters not only to students but to the public is the visual. The visual is the dominant way of transmitting messages rather than the literal. And the visual here is in the extraordinary effect of contemporary film footage showing how soldiers use these instruments. I'll show you another example of the same thing. This one I particularly am proud of. I consider it a syllogism. There's um, offensive weapons on the left, defensive weapons in the middle, uh, or defensive equipment in the middle, and surgery on the right. Anybody who looks at these will realize that the instruments of tearing human flesh were much more powerful than the instruments of, of protection and defense. And the surgical um, fosse on the right had it, a flute of an extraordinary uh, French novelist, Georges Duhamel, who was also a surgeon and who played the flute in order to keep his sanity while he's dealing with all the amputations and other forms of surgery that had to do because offense dominated and overwhelmed defense. Now, again, forcing the eyes downward of the, of the public is the critical issue. The dialectic between the vertical and the horizontal we used in another way. This is called the Hall of Portraits, and it shows in the front just ordinary uh, family album photographs of normal life, 
And behind it, very horizontally, is a series of 50 uh, um, etchings by the German artist Otto Dix, who fought at Peron at this, on the Somme where the, where the museum is. And what he did was to show the horrors of war uh, that he himself knew in a horizontal way. There's, this is an image of a soldier who suddenly realizes that he's been eviscerated, his, his stomach is open, and almost all soldiers got the point, 90% death rate to stomach wounds. So the, the use of these images that simply suggest the horror of battle is one reason why I claim that by using this axis of representations in an, in an original way, won all the prizes and so on, we were creating a pacifist museum, a museum that shows the ugliness of war in an unremitting way. At a moment, 1992, 1992, when the Maastricht Treaty was signed, creating a common labor market <coughs> and common borders so that you can drive between France and Germany the way you drive between Pennsylvania um, and New Jersey. It, it is an extraordinary moment. It was an extraordinary moment for me, and very, very rare for an historian, to have the, uh, the, the, the wonderful opportunity to create something in three dimensions. We historians are trained to, to write and to imagine. I was able to imagine in space and in time. After all, what are museums? They are places where we convert time into space. And the space of war is the space of suffering. Now, the point I want to make is that this movement of creating a, uh, uh, a museum of, uh, of war was transnational. By transnational, I mean something extraordinary. In that period, when I mentioned to you already that between 1960 and 1990, there, were, there was a trebling of the number of people in higher education, very remarkable. There was also a trebling in the number of jobs. And so what happened in that period in my field is that there were many instances, and you have them on your faculty as well, of people who were born in one country, who were educated in their higher degrees in a second country, and teach in a third. These are transnational people who bring different national perspectives to bear on their work. Now, it was my good fortune over many, many years to see this field of the cultural history of war expand enormously. You know, when Ken Burns did his, uh, his wonderful television series on the US Civil War using letters and photographs, he was doing cultural history. That's what he was doing, which is cultural history is the study of how people make sense of the violent world in which they live. That's all it is. It's a way of un how do people understand the world in which they live. He did that brilliantly. I was lucky enough to get some money to do a television series on the First World War where the same thing was our uh, uh, challenge, is to create an understanding, a better, wider understanding of what was revolutionary about this war. And it was fundamentally two things. One is the killing power of artillery was revolutionary. 80% of the men who died in the First World War were killed by artillery not by machine guns, not by aircraft, but by artillery. It's industrialized assembly line killing. And the second thing that happened in the First World War was the, was the uh, blurring and then finally the erasure of the distinction between civilian and military targets. War in 1914-18 became war against civilians. And to create this broad opinion, this broad as it were understanding, television museums were necessary, but so was scholarship. I don't believe for a moment that the way we understand history separates the academy from the large number of people who are interested in history outside of it. I think it binds us together. And the more historians work outside of the university, the better. Well, fortunately, I was able to see this through, through creating a three-volume uh, history of the First World War to express this vision of transnational historians. And I've shown uh, this these series of photographs, which I'll do very quickly in order to give plenty of time for questions, to show how my claim that the visual is the most important way of understanding uh, history has worked out in this new project that was published in 2014 by 70 historians. 50 of them were what I described, born in one country, educated in a second, uh, teaching in a third. This is a, a photograph taken by German authorities in a prisoner of war camp to figure out which nations the African soldiers whom they had captured came from. They also foolishly uh, created an, an Africa that never existed, which is the guy on the right who's Vietnamese. 
So the, the ca captions show the limitation of the German prisoner of war system. This is an image of what's called the Trench of the Bayonets. It's an American story. An American philanthropist decided to create a monument in France uh, to uh, a legend. The legend was that French soldiers literally stood with their bayonets uh, and died when their trench fell in holding their bayonets. That's not the case. German soldiers put the bayonets there to tell French soldiers where their men are buried. But it became a heroic American idea. Uh, I think somehow the, the concept of heroism survived longer in this country than it did elsewhere uh, for reasons we can discuss. Um, but this is a, an American creation of a French legend. This is a French story of the transnational. This is a, an ossuary in the front of the giant graveyards in Verdun. And in this ossuary, a, a Catholic uh, priest, Monsignor Ginisti, who was the bishop of Verdun, created something un unbelievable. It's a big battlefield, one of these extraordinary places where you see war and feel it because you see it. And what you see is this. In that building here, and I think here, there it is. You see, right at, at ground level, there is uh, an ossuary where the bones of those who fought in the second battle of 1916, the one that was uh, equal to the battle of the Somme and meaninglessness and stupidity, 10 months, 10 months, never a battle as long as that before, never a battle as long as that after, no Stalingrad, no nothing, no bulge, no battle ever lost it as long as the Battle of Verdun, and this is what remains of it. There it is. Who can tell the difference between the French and the German soldiers who died there? No one can. The war, war is a field of suffering in which national boundaries collapse and in which to imagine what it's like. One needs to take the viewpoint of humanity rather than that of a single nation. Now, ah, here's some interesting examples of what empire looks like. This is an Indian soldier signing on for the duration with a white hand telling him what to do. There was, of course, that degree of imperial superiority. This is a postcard of a French soldier. Notice the German helmet he's holding, who is a brave man, being treated by a, a, a French nurse, I think, in a way that is loving rather than race, racist. The encounters weren't always those of hostile uh, racial groups. Uh, love uh, describes the landscape of war uh, in many ways equal to that of hatred. This is an encounter, hmm, an encounter which created the global war, or gives you a sense of what global war really means. This is an Egyptian doctor treating a Vietnamese laborer for paralytic beriberi because he didn't get enough stuff to eat aside from rice. And here, is a French doctor taking some pictures of dying Serbian soldiers in the Isle, in the Isle of Lido uh, near Corfu. The whole world was involved in this story in a way that is very rarely understood. Here's part of the war against civilians. <coughs> in 1914, <coughs> the Russian army moved into Austria-Hungary and got a very, very bad defeat. In retreat, they engaged in one of the major pogroms of the 20th century and evicted, literally expelled from their homes, Russian citizens, 500,000 of them, whom they thought were dangerous, in danger of greeting the German and Austrians as liberators. And these are people who were literally thrown out of their homes with nowhere else to go because under Russian law they had to live in the Pale of Settlement and now the Russian army told them they had to live nowhere. Now, the individual on the left is saying his morning prayers, and he represents to me the icon of the 20th century, the refugee. The refugee symbolizes everything about the destruction of the distinction between civilian and military targets. The Italian philosopher Agamben calls this their life, where there's no protection in law, there's no protection uh, in military affairs, there's no protection on this earth at all. The verticality of, of war existed. It wasn't only horizontal. In Italy, the mountain war was absolutely terrifying. <clears throat> you can imagine what artillery does in a landscape like that, or like this, or what happens to, to casualties when they have to be brought down. The Italian front was one of the worst. There were 15 battles of the Isonzo, in not very far from this place. You can imagine the horror that soldiers had to face in the course of it. This is what the Eastern Front looked like, another part of the war that most people don't. This is on the boundaries of the Ukraine. 
uh, in which, of course, artificial boundaries were created at the end of the First World War, as in many other parts of the world, and we're beginning to sort them out uh, just now. I like this picture because it shows that what a high-tech war needed. Whenever high-tech broke down, there were horses available to take them uh, to wherever they had to be fixed. And horses are very important in the course of the First World War. Millions of them fought. This is an example of the war in South America. This is off Argentina, uh, the Maldives, if you will. And it shows um, HMS Inflexible picking up uh, German sailors in 1914. The Inflexible wasn't quite that, or maybe it was, because it got sunk two years later. This one, actually, I want to linger on for a moment. This is a picture of a Japanese cruiser. This is, these are all in the Cambridge history of the First World War. This, this picture shows the, a Japanese cruiser uh, doing patrol duty off the coast of Vancouver uh, in uh, Canada. Most people don't realize that the Japanese were allies in the First World War. They were on our side. And their navy was the strongest in the Pacific when the US Navy had the job in the Atlantic of taking between two and five million soldiers across to France. So through the Anglo-Japanese Anglo -Japanese, uh, defense agreement, the Japanese Navy had the stated mission of, def of defending the western coast of Canada and the secret mission of defending California. You want to see the origins of the war over the Pacific? It's right here in a, in a photograph I don't think that's ever appeared before in any history of the First World War. Now, horses, as I said, are ubiquitous. They're all over, and so is mud. You can imagine the suffering that went on for the horses. I found over many, many years that soldiers, in writing their letters home, had a kind of code of stoicism, that men didn't talk about their suffering very much, but they always talked about the suffering of their animals. 80% of the men who fought were farmers, were peasants, who came from the countryside. They knew what it was that soldiers suffered from artillery, from gas, just as much as they did. And the sound of a suffering horse in no man's land would drive them literally insane. This is an image. How did that half a horse get up in the tree? Again, the uh, idea of the uncanny that Freud developed in the course of the First World War comes out of images like this. Dead bodies on a horse. This I like. It's a grand carnival for sick and wounded horses. The profession of veterinary science took leaps and bounds into, uh, into the 20th century because the horses had to be patched up just as much as the men did. High tech, flamethrower. High tech, this is an historic picture of the first gas attack in history. When there was a gas attack by the Syrian government, I believe, what was it, two years ago? First World War was coming back to haunt us. This is the 22nd of April, 1915. Next year, I'll be at the site of this. This was not a war-winning weapon for a very simple reason. You can see on the screen what happens when the wind changes direction. you got a problem. And not only that, it rains all the time in Belgium. This is near Ypres, so the gas would, as long as you don't fall, um, uh, it won't hurt you. But it could torture you if the wind blew the right way. And it produced extraordinary images. Who needs surrealism when you have the First World War? The human face? No longer. Horses with gas masks didn't affect their eyes. Blinded horses were an effect of gas warfare uh, by the tens of thousands. And so was the granddaddy of napalm, mustard gas. This is an American soldier. In 1918, when the US Army was fully engaged, one out of every four shells fired on the Western Front by the American artillery, Harry Truman and friends, as much as anybody else, was a gas shell. Gas warfare was everybody's business in the First World War. The, the, the fact that it was a weapon, uh, a monstrous uh, weapon uh, against international law made virtually no difference at all. The ultimate example of the destruction of the boundary between civilian and military uh, targets is the Armenian Genocide of 1915. I spent a lot of years going to Turkey to try to persuade individuals there, men and women of good conscience, that it is absolutely immoral for their government to deny that this happened. There are hundreds of thousands of photographs of the deportation of people who had lived in these villages for a thousand years in the east of Turkey and who, because of the uh, uh, Ottoman-Turkish-Armenian conflict and because Armenians fought with the Russian army, were deported. Over 1.5 million of them died 
in the course of that deportation into the Mesopotamian uh, desert in the summer. This was the crime of humanity that preceded the Holocaust. It's my view not only because of the Armenian genocide, but also because of the use of gas and because of the industrialization of warfare, that without the Somme, without Verdun, without Armenia, Auschwitz was unthinkable. It would have been impossible for there to have been a Holocaust without the First World War. These are some of the survivors in um, an Aleppo camp, which is actually now, you know, in ironies of history, uh, a Red Cross center today dealing with the victims of civil war uh, as I speak. Now, it wasn't just inhumanity that was transformed, but so was humanity. I'm not a great admirer of Herbert Hoover as president. I don't know anybody who is. But he was a great man before he entered the White House. He was the author and executive figure behind the first foreign aid um, project in history. It was there to feed the children of Belgium in 1914-15, and there to feed, feed the whole of Eastern Europe. And like Walmart, he understood that transport is everything. He was an engineer, a civil engineer who had been in Russia before the outbreak of the First World War. Transport is everything. And he wound up creating a foreign aid program that made money. It was astonishing. It, you know, and again, if you think of Murphy's Law, he should have stayed there rather than try for the White House. He would have been the, one of the great men of the 20th century because he showed that humanity didn't die in the First World War. Humanity took on a new face. Uh, the face of a generosity that saved the lives of millions of children, millions of men and millions of women, just as it took it. Well, the conclusion I want to uh, draw, I believe I still am in time, is that the First World War was the opening of a monstrous period of violence which is unfortunately still our fate to deal with today. It's happening in different parts of the world as I speak, and what makes it terrible are the twofold issues I dealt with. First of all, there is no limit to the killing capacity of technology. Well, we know that from nuclear weapons, but even if we put them aside. And secondly, there is no safety for people like you and me who are civilians. Everyone is a target of war. Hence, the museum that I helped build is still in business 22 years later. It still draws in the crowds. And today, and for the next four years, it will be engaged in an extraordinary period of remembrance where to speak of the First World War is certainly not to celebrate it. That would leave a taste as of ashes in everyone's throat. But to see the abomination of war precisely as it was, as a disfigurement of humanity which began in new ways in 1914 and which still haunt us and create an environment of vulnerability and suffering with which we have to deal still today. Thank you very much. I would be very pleased to take uh, questions, comments, or objections. Uh, and uh, if uh, I believe that the microphones here will be uh, agreeable to anyone who wishes to step forward, please. I know preference is usually given to students to go first. And as a chaplain, I try very hard not to trespass the rules. <laughs> but I would like to say this to you publicly. All my life, I've grown up with the saying that, Hit that Hitler said, who remembers the Armenians? I can't thank you enough for remembering us, because when I hear about World War I, our story is absent most of the time. There are brave Turkish scholars, there are Armenians, and even my own work to give voice to it. But I have never attended a public presentation from somebody who is not Armenian who did what you just did today. And I can't thank you enough because all of my family, with the exception of one cousin, survived. They all died. And so thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, in the recent past, I've noted a television commercial uh, 
which solicits donations to the Wounded Warriors Project. And it shows uh, a veteran and his family. He's gradually being helped by his children to walk and so on. And my distinct impression is that he is blind, although that's not openly stated. In your um, reference to the visual, uh, it just made me wonder if you happen to know statistically how many um, of the survivors of the First World War were blinded and um, also how that might compare with subsequent wars. Thank you. One of the difficulties in answering your question is that military statistics are notoriously inaccurate. Um, I have, in, and again, in the Cambridge history, the same thing, uh, we try to work this through. Almost all estimates of soldiers who were disabled in war are underestimates, all of them. Uh, and the figure of uh, those who were disabled in war that I have available to me uh, are probably underestimates too. We worked hard to make them as accurate as we could. Of the 70 million men who died in the First World War, 10 million were killed. 26 million uh, were wounded. Of those 26 million, 5 million were blind. 5 million, which is twice the official estimates. And what we, what we did basically was to establish how medical uh, personnel proceeded. You see, very frequently blinded men had other disabilities. They were, they were shot or they lost an arm or something. And the fundamental issue was which would be the most likely one to put on a form to get somebody a, um, a pension. And if you lost your arm, you weren't gonna get it back. But if you lost your sight, there was still hope that you could get it back. There were substantial developments in medical science that were helpful. I mean, uh, this was not in the First World War. In the Second World War, I don't know, I've had two cataract operations. That came out of military medicine in dealing with RAF pilots who had metal in, the, you know, plastic, no, it's plastic, um, that came from the cockpit covers in their eyes. So the, the blindness issue was one that was treated differently from physical injuries of other kinds. Uh, nonetheless, if you think about it for a moment, that's a staggering army. And in many ways, these are the disabled of the First World War and of the Second, and indeed of later wars, are the true unknown soldiers. They fade into the backdrop and have become not the society's responsibility, which almost always undertreats them and undervalues them, but it becomes the business of family life, and in particular of women, who have to clean up the mess that men create in war. I'm Emily Hawk, and I'm a junior. I study history and dance, so I'm very fascinated by your mention of the dimensions of vertical and horizontal and what that can mean. So then, when you put that in a museum and it's three-dimensional, if horizontal is passivism, I'm wondering what the third dimension of depth. Do you have any thoughts on what that would mean? Well, the, you see, the uh, you would I think the issue of uh, of forcing the gaze of the viewer in one direction or another is the point I wanted to make. Uh, the horizontal, uh, in, my, in my view, I'll put it simply. The vertical is the language of hope, the horizontal is the language of mourning. It's that simple. And of course, mourning can happen in a hundred ways that are not necessarily horizontal. I'm not, but it's a way of announcing to visitors the spatial organization of an historical interpretation. That's, that's basically what it was. Uh, so that three-dimensionality in, you know, in all of these issues um, uh, involves some inflection towards the vertical. But it, uh, believe me, if you go to military museums, you'll see the rockets, you'll see the naval guns, you'll see the soldiers standing like this, in which, you know, I don't want to make the case that it's phallic, but it's certainly hopeful. That the, and, and maybe that's the difference between the United States and Europe, that the Civil War, which was the bloodiest uh, war in this country's history by far, uh, was a war in which those who fought um, fought for something one might describe as noble, the lost cause, the union, emancipation. But what was noble about fighting in the First World War? There was an attempt to create nobility. We discussed in a class earlier today through, through the language of spirituality, a higher cause. I'm giving my life to, you know, for my brothers. And that was true. I don't dismiss it at all. But on a scale, that the world had never seen before, these words tend to be exploded in the same way as the bodies of the men who tried to voice them. So the three-dimensionality of, of war, in my view, has ignored 
the horizontal as a fundamental axis of understanding, and we simply wanted to correct it. Uh, but I take your point. There is no you know, three-dimensionality that doesn't move in multiple directions at once. You're perfectly right. And thank you for that. Hi, I'm uh, Ryan Franklin from Bonchek. I'm a freshman, and my question was, uh, do you have any specific turning point in the war, or if, if there is not one turning point, what was the biggest technological advance that had the greatest impact? Okay, the turning point in my view was right at the beginning. Um, when the German Empire decided to invade Belgium and France in 1914, on that very day they lost the war. And the reason I say that is because by invading Belgium and France, they were forcing Britain into the war. Not for a moral reason, for a strategic reason. Because if the Germans had defeated the French, the German Navy would be in the Channel ports. And anybody who's been to Calais uh, or uh, to Dover will realize that Britain is an island, and if the German Navy is in the Channel ports, German Navy controls food imports into Britain. The British could not tolerate a German victory over France that would give it, Germany, control over shipping. And any country which is, as it were, dependent upon the economic power of a neighbor is a satellite of that country. It's true. There's nothing that we can do about that. It's a reality. So by pushing the British nation reluctantly into war and the British Empire along with it, Germany lost the war. After all, she fought the war to gain, Germany fought the war to gain an empire. That's what, what it was about, primarily. But she needed an empire to win the war. Here's a war, I think, that was lost on the very first day. And all the technological changes that came later on didn't change that balance. Please. Thank you for your talk, first of all. My name is Stephen Vieira. I study history at the college. And something that I thought was interesting is how you kept talking about the transnational character of the war, but also how you feel that most ways we engage with it begin on a family or a personal level. So my question is, how do you think that the personal lens that people use to begin thinking about the war affects the discourse on it as an international event? Yeah, Thank you. I would use the word transnational. Let me give you an example. Uh, my wife has joined me here, who's an archivist in the National Archives in Paris. Um, and what has happened this last year in France is an appeal called the Grand Collect uh, of the National Archives and of the National Library for people to come forward with the stuff in their attics, where great uncle Harry had his photograph album and maybe his medals and maybe even his uniform or whatever was there. And a lot of people are fed up you know, with having all of this stuff and they, they want to get rid of it. So the idea was to bring this into uh, the public realm and to create archives out of this family material. And what, what has happened, fascinating, is the number of things that came forward from all parts of the world because there were Vietnamese, as you saw, Vietnamese soldiers who fought for France. There were Senegalese, African soldiers who fought for France. There were Moroccans, who, the families of which are now in Paris. They've moved across borders. And my, my claim, you see, is that family history in different parts of the world is not very different from that of the neighbors. Um, yes, maybe some customs are a little bit different, but, but fundamentally, what war did was to destroy family life on a grand scale across national boundaries. So I prefer the term transnational because war is bigger than any of the nations that deal with it. And we've had enough international history in the period of the Cold War. Cold War was dominated by a international conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. 1989 came, 1991 came, time for something different. Now, look, we all know with our cell phones, information crosses national boundaries, so does capital, you know, so does, uh, so does good, and so do people, whether they're, they do it according to the law or not. History has to catch up. The transnational is the way we live our lives. It's the way we do our history. And I think family life is the perfect example of that. I, you know, I've spent a lot of time dealing with undocumented migrants in my town in New Haven. Their family lives are identical to mine. I, I don't see any difference between them. Uh, the, you know, the conflicts are the same. The grandparents are needed, et cetera. 
when you see your children and your grandchildren, you better bring your checkbook. I mean, they're all, they're all stuff we all know. And, and I, you know, I, it, it, the, the claim I think I want to make is basically this. We need national history, but we need to write it in a transnational way because that's the world in which we live. So it's time, as it were, to recognize that historians have to, have to flow with the times. Time for one more question. One last. Who's got the last word? I've persuaded all of you. How extraordinary. Yes, sir, please come up. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm John Martino, class of 74. It's a great program, and uh, Dr. Mueller was very uh, kind to initiate it. I believe his father was a World War I veteran. Uh, would you be able to just briefly tick off the hot spots of the world today and just correlates them somehow to unresolved business of World War I? Okay, that's easy. <laughs> and you want to go to your classes too, so we have about three minutes, is that right? Okay. Let me start with just two. In 1919, uh, Woodrow Wilson had a tough problem. Uh, the Germans had occupied a, a province called Shandong in China. It was part of their concessions. And at the end of the war, China's an ally and so is Japan. Japan wanted it. Japan's navy, as you saw, was big time. China's army was not. Civil, civil war it basically tied it down in China. So whatever he thought about self-determination, Wilson went along with giving Shandong, where Confucius was born, to uh, Japan. When the uh, second man in command of the Japanese of the Chinese delegation telegraphed this bad news and asked for instructions, a man named Wellington Koo, he didn't get a response. He found out three days later why, through telephone calls. When the people got the message back that Shandong was gonna be uh, Japanese and that self-determination meant nothing, they burned down the telegraph office, a good deal of European Beijing beside, marched to create something called the May the Fourth Movement, which is the embryo of the Chinese Communist Party. Imagine Woodrow Wilson as the godfather of the Chinese Communist Party. Got part of the argument. The second one is, the, and this, on this I will end, um, the end of the Ottoman Empire was the end of the caliphate because the sultan was the, was the head of the Islamic nation with, with the property of the great sites of Mecca and Medina in his, in his hands. Uh, for political reasons, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the father of modern Turkey, abolished the caliphate. This created a crisis in Islam. What would be the center of it? How can they see the future of Islam with, when all they see are, are prostrate leaders in the Arab world uh, doing the beck and call of the imperial leaders? So 1928, a small organization was created to try to handle the crisis in Islam coming out of the First World War called the Muslim Brotherhood. We haven't heard the last of it since. Thank you. <laughs>